The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. So what do you think of St. Patrick's Day? Is it just a pathetic day of indulgence and excess, or is it a sweet opportunity to appreciate Irish culture? You know, in early March, you cannot possibly mistake what time of year it is. Every drugstore, every grocery store, retail stores are just papered in the color green, and you know why. It's not only because people are longing for spring, although the green is kind of a sweet color if you come from the land of ice and snow, but it's because St. Patrick's Day is coming, and people are finding a way to try to use that event which is, you know, always celebrated in mid-March, to use that event to sell things. And it sort of lends to the festivity and kind of brightens up the, uh, as winter kind of grinds to an end. There's lots of things that have become logos or symbols of Ireland and the Irish people, although, can I be honest here, I don't know how much true Irish people really like to be represented in this way. One of them, of course, is rainbows. You see rainbows everywhere, and at the end of that rainbow is the pot of gold. It goes, of course, with the legends that that's where you can find treasure. And I guess it's kind of silly, but it's, it's cute, too. And then, of course, along with the rainbows come these tiny little men with the hats with a great big buckle, and those are, of course, the leprechauns. If I were Irish, I don't know if I would really want to be characterized in that way, but it's too late. That decision's long been made, and leprechauns have become a symbol of the Irish people all over the place. What's, of course, even worse is the certain mascot or logo for a certain university in America uh, called Notre Dame actually has as its mascot, its team mascot, the fighting Irish. So here's, a, here's another sort of stereotype that the Irish are brawlers and fighters. And that leads to another, I guess you could call it stereotype, another emblem of Scotland which has become Patrick. And it is his feast day that is being observed, although there's not very much, if any, Christianity in what is going on and what passes for St. Patrick's Day in America. Instead, St. Patrick's Day in people's minds is equated with going out, partying, maybe eating corned beef and cabbage, but certainly drinking, drinking a lot. In fact, it seems as though St. Patrick's Day becomes a license, like a card you can carry to pardon you for excessive binge drinking. And there, nothing could be more repulsive, not only to Irish people who really know and care about who Patrick really was, of course, excesses like that are no pleasure to our God either. Another image, another icon of Ireland is associated with Patrick, and that is the shamrock. Now the shamrock is a variation of clover, but not what Americans kind of superstitiously have fallen in love with a symbol of good luck, the four-leaf clover. The shamrock is a three-leaf clover. And Patrick used it, at least according to legend he did. That legend has been around for at least three or four hundred years. Who knows how true it is or not? It sort of doesn't matter anymore. But whether he did or not, it's still a great story and instructive for you and me today. The story was that Patrick, who actually was not the patron saint of drinking. Patrick actually was a British man who was kidnapped by Irish raiding pirates and taken as a slave as a teenager and forced to work as a shepherd in the animal care industry in Ireland. And he ironically escaped but fell in love with his enslavers, with the Irish people. And even though he gained his freedom, he chose to go back and evangelize the Irish people, most of whom were not Christians. There was very little of a Christian presence in Ireland when Patrick returned. Ireland was um, a wild and um, semi-organized place, no, never had a strong central government, and many of their religious practices can be described by the word Druidism, which recognized various deities in nature. We would call them pagans today, and Patrick 
the real Patrick dedicated his life to the evangelization of pagans, of bringing Jesus Christ to people who did not know him. And whether or not he actually used shamrocks, Patrick brought the message of the true God is one in three and three in one, just like a shamrock where there are three recognizable lobes on this little leaf, but really it's just one. Patrick brought the message of the true God and said all other substitutes are phonies. Here is the real God. Here is the truth. The real God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isaiah is talking to people of the land of Israel, the northern half of the country is falling apart, but the southern part is, is intact and it's going to stay intact for at least another hundred years or longer. But their time is coming too. The northern kingdom is going to be taken into captivity. But Isaiah correctly prophesies over a century in advance that Babylon, a nation that as yet is not really a nation, it's only a subunit of the mighty Assyrian Empire. But Isaiah names names and said the Babylonians are going to come and God is going to give them supernatural power to be victorious and take the southern people, the Judeans, into captivity. But it's going to be protective custody. It'll all be for the good. And then when the people of Babylon, Isaiah predicts, still do not believe in the God who gave them power but cling to their own gods, they too will be slid off their uh, king of the mountain position and others. And here again, he names names. It'll be Cyrus the Persian who will push the Babylonians out of the way. All because of the intervention of the true God who is not the same thing as the gods of Persia and is not the same thing as the gods of of Babylon. They're listed by name, the two big ones in the first line of chapter 46. Bel bows down. Bel is the, the equivalent of the Canaanite god Baal. It means Lord. And Nebo is his son in, in Babylonian mythology. And he says, they bow down, they stoop low. They're, they're nothing but idols. They're man-made and they're born by beasts of burden. So the only way these statues can get around is if you hitch them onto a donkey cart. That's the only way they're mobile. And he who sits in the heavens just laughs. And he waits his time and does his thing. Now, Judah is getting spanked for the sins and, and getting a spanking which they richly deserve. And our story picks up at verse 8. This is God's admonition to Judea to use the experiences that are coming. Their century of breather time to repent and reclaim their faith, to hang on and give them toughness and endurance during the battles and wars that are coming, which will result in their becoming captives. There are two generations in exile in Babylon, but to hold God to his word that they will be brought back from Babylon and replanted so God can finish his saving work of preparing a nation through which the Savior of the, wor the world is going to be born. So this is all Isaiah's laying out the future for them so that they don't panic, but also so they get it. Remember this, you Israelites, fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. Remember your history. Remember why God put you together. Remember the Exodus. Remember what God did to Egypt. Remember those 40 years in the wilderness. Remember the words of your prophets. Remember Moses. Remember the bright cloud of glory that lived in your tabernacle and in your temple. Remember the words of your scriptures that have been given to you. Remember how God has revealed your place in his purposes. I am God and there is no other. No competition. It's all or nothing. There is only one God. All the rest are imitations. They're man-made substitutes groping around 
to make something believable so that people can answer that call that's placed into each of their hearts to worship something bigger than they are. But anything that man has made will fall apart. It is an idol. And our goal is, and our job is not to make a God that we find believable enough, but to pay attention to the one who's there, who's always been there, and who always will be there. I am God and there is no other. Bel and Nebo are nothing. Marduk, nothing. There's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. In other words, I sweep through time backwards and forwards, eternal in both directions. I have seen it all. I'm engaged now and I will be here after you're dead. I am the one who is master of not only the universe but time as well. From ancient times, what is still to come, I was there at the creation and I will be there through all eternity when you're in your grave. I say, my purpose will stand. And sometimes I accomplish that purpose by spoiling you and pouring blessings into your life, making you powerful and rich. And sometimes I will accomplish my saving purpose by taking things away from you, by making you struggle, by making you thirsty and hungry, by making you prisoners, by making you exiles from your own land. But my purpose will come true, which is to gather you and create faith in your heart and keep you believing in me. For only through my rescue plan can you become pleasing to me and share in my eternity. My purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey. That Now that might be a little allusion to the successor to the Babylonians. They existed for only two generations and after 60 or 70 years or so, they were bumped off the mountain by the Persians. And this bird of prey might be a reference to Cyrus, the first great emperor of the Persian Empire. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted, you who are far from righteousness, I'm bringing my righteousness near. What you can't earn, I will give you. What you need, I alone can provide. Accept no substitutes, me or nothing. Get the point? Am I like overkilling this? It's not far away. My salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion my splendor to Israel. And God's plan really worked. The people of Judea were remarkably less prone to idolatry when they came back. We just, after the exile, we just don't hear about Baal worship the way we used to before. And when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made of a Jewish woman, as he had promised to a Jewish man named Abraham, the first of the Jews. In fact, like a pre-Jew. He's the great-grandfather of Judah from which the, the race of the Jews got its name. And at just the right time, God himself took on human flesh, walked the earth, obeyed God's laws perfectly as a replacement for you and for me, suffered in his body the wrath of God in your place, was hung on a cross as a gift to you to bear the blow that should have landed on you, was buried as you will be buried and burst out in order to break off the locks on your tomb and give you the confidence that your grave is only a portal, only a doorway, exploded into life on Easter Sunday in order to give you certainty of your forgiveness of your sins and to give you certainty of your own immortality so that you can handle anything that may come along because you can already see a happy ending to your life. That light at the end of the tunnel is not a train coming at you. It is the lights of God's living room and he's there waiting for you at the end with his arms wide open. That is his gift to you. This vigorous message coming straight from God to the believers uh, ends with a bang. He said, I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. 
Zion is originally the narrow ridge upon which the original inhabitants of that region, the Jebusites, had built their fortress. And it was such a steep ridge that it was hard to take militarily. It's why it held out so long. And it was not until the time of King David that they actually, Israelites were actually able to conquer that land and incorporate it as part of what became their region of Judea. And it was just north of that skinny little ridge on what was then a threshing floor that the temple was going to be built. So that ridge called Zion became a metaphor for Jerusalem itself, for the dwelling place of God himself where God lived in that bright cloud above the golden box in the very middle of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant. And God said, I'm going to grant salvation to Zion, my splendor, to Israel. Zion then becomes a metaphor for all of Israel and by extension, everybody who's a believer. God is saying it's exclusive. I am giving this gift. It's going to be given to the world through these people and in this place. And there is no competition. He said, I'm God. There is no other. I am God. There's none like me. That's in verse 9. And the salvation that was bought for the world was purchased on a cross in that location, in Jerusalem. That is where the Son of God gave his life. So this is an inclusive claim in that it was bought for the world, but it's exclusive, that it's this way or nothing. And I believe that it was that inclusivity and exclusivity that drove Patrick to do what he did. An extraordinary man who grew up in what we would today call Scotland. In that day, it was just Britain, Roman Britain. It was on the Roman side of the wall that separated England from the wild Scots and Celts uh, to the north. And as I told you earlier, he was kidnapped, taken to Ireland, served for some years there, escaped. But two things happened that changed his way of thinking. One was he had grown to love the Irish people. And another thing that changed was that he, Patrick, his faith, which he maybe was kind of indifferent about as a youth, as many young people are, it just burned inside of him. And he really grew in his intensity and in his passion for spreading the gospel. He believed that it was for all, but he also believed that only through Jesus Christ could people be reconciled and happy and have a great relationship with the real God, the one God beside whom there is no other. And so voluntarily he went back to Ireland. That's the real Patrick, not the green beer Patrick, not the one who supposedly drove all the snakes out of Ireland. That's just a myth. The real Patrick lived in the 400s AD and dedicated his life to recruiting a band of helpers who became traveling missionary monks to bring Jesus Christ to the Irish people. The Druids, were, uh, who were the religious leaders at that time, were almost as powerful as the, the kings themselves, the various kings of the region of Ireland. And they exercised a great hold over the thought and imagination of the Irish people. But Patrick brought game. He brought the power and message of the Son of God who came to this world and was uh, suffered, as Patrick did, only was suffered on a cross, gave his life in order to give forgiveness to the world. And it was that Savior that Patrick witnessed to. It was that Savior who brought forgiveness to the Irish people. And in greater and greater numbers, they turned to the Lord. And God blessed Patrick's mission with great success. He trained brothers like him as monks, only a different kind of monk from the monasticism that existed on the continent, where it was more sedentary, where you'd join a, a convent or a monastery and stay put. These Irish were restless, and as soon as their number of brothers got to be more than about 20, they'd split off and they'd go up farther north and start a new monastery. And in this way, the faith was replicated and they built communities where you could be safe because the Druids some, sometimes would counterattack and stimulate the local kings enough to counterattack and try to kill them. That brings us to today. So what? Is this, this is, you know, here's one of Pastor Mark's history lessons. Wake me up when he's, when he's done. This is a big deal because you're in that same struggle today. You face tremendous pressure to water down your faith to be more acceptable to the culture around us. People are laughing at creation, a six-day creation, 
Well, you can let go of the first 11 chapters of Genesis and it won't hurt anything. Um, if the whole world, most of the academic world and every museum and every zoo in this country says that these things all evolved over the course of millions of years, why would we want to fight against that? Just let, you can let go of that piece. Why in an age that cannot stand intolerance, why would we insist on Christ is the only way? Can't there be some good in Islam and Buddhism? Can't there be some good where uh, we just, every, all religions believe in universal brotherhood and sisterhood? And can't, why can't we all just sort of say there are many ways and many paths to the one God and just kind of chill a little bit? And bit by bit, some Christians are weary of the struggle and have acknowledged that there are many other ways to find God besides Christ. And that is deadly. What did God say? This is his word to you in your culture wars. I am God, there is no other. Jesus Christ said, no one comes to the Father but by me. And in this sense, Christianity is exclusive only through Christ. And with all due respect, all other religions and gods are man-made and will crumble to dust when the Lord returns. But Christianity is also inclusive. For the Lord Jesus spread his hands wide when he died, wide enough to love and forgive the whole world. And you and I are sons and daughters of Patrick now to carry good news from God for guilty consciences in a culture gone mad. We are, every year we live, social scientists call it a post-Christian culture. Every year you manage to survive another year. The land around you is a little bit less Christian and less religious, more hedonistic, more pleasure-loving, more self-centered, more secular, more humanistic. And so you and I have, have a missionary journey all, all over again. And we are entering into a, a culture in a world where Christianity has given away so much and folded so often the, the good news has been watered down and it's not so very good anymore. Here is the way we can truly honor St. Patrick in a way far better than hoisting a mug of green beer this week. And that is fearlessly to hold out the one God, there is no other, but that that one God has brought salvation through Zion and gives it to you and me, to a world guilty and broken in sin, a world that's dying and falling apart, a world that is collapsing because of human selfishness. Horrible cruelties being visited by one upon another. Here is God's answer to that riddle. Here is forgiveness for human foolishness and sin and evil. Here is the only conqueror of Satan. Here is a gift, the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Here is a father who made the world. We're not evolutionary accidents. Here is the Son who shed his blood that you might live. And here is the Holy Spirit who gives you the wisdom to get it and the power to live it. Father, Son, and Spirit, we give you glory, the glory of the shamrock. We give it to you today. Amen. Even in the middle of the greatest financial crisis since the Depression, Time of Grace partners and viewers have prayed for us, believed, and have given. Your continuing financial support each month makes an incredible difference in our ability to share this message with the world. I'm really thrilled to have you as my partner. I really do mean you're my ministry partner. Just as you can depend on me to be there regularly for you, I depend on you with your regular support. And in this way, as a Grace Partner, my voice really is your voice answering the Great Commission to bring the good news of Jesus to the world. Never in the history of Time of Grace have we wanted to thank our partners and viewers more than right now. When you give your regular monthly gift and become a Grace Partner, it helps us with the production and airtime cost involved in extending this message to a world desperately in need. Millions more are waiting to hear this precious message, and because of your partnership in the gospel, the world has hope. I hope you've had a chance by now to enjoy the Grace Moment devotions that I prepare. 
Normally we have them printed up and we mail them out in little booklet form and of course I have my Grace Moments book, Hardbound, which has gathered together a year's worth. But did you know that you can get these little speed Bible studies, these little Bible study minis sent to you electronically? On your screen right now is the website where you can go and register and subscribe for free and each day you will receive one from me in your inbox. Or if you have a cell phone, what you can do is you can text the word MOMENTS to the number 22828 and that also will do the trick. And you and I can have a little meeting every morning and have one of my little speed Bible studies to help get your day off to a great start. Something else I'd like you to know about Perhaps you yourself have a lot of self-doubt and fears about how you and God are doing, or perhaps you know someone who really struggles with issues of self-worth and does not have a happy and stable and peaceful relationship with God. If that describes you or someone you know, then this booklet that Time of Grace provides is for you. It's called, Is There Hope for Me? And it leads people to uh, look at their lives and then leads them into the Bible so that they can hear God's voice speaking to their issues and problems so that they can know there is indeed hope for them. To get your free copy of Is There Hope For Me, just give us a call. The number's on your screen. Or send us a letter or shoot us an email and we'd be happy to send it to you. If you know someone who is struggling with these issues, we'd be glad to send you a copy for that person as well. Let's pray today. As we ponder the great ministry of Patrick, let's pray for that same kind of evangelism passion. Lord Jesus, you used a friend of yours named Patrick to do enormous and wonderful things for the people of Ireland. You helped Ireland to hear the good news of their Savior Jesus, to bring them forgiveness of their sins and hope everlasting. We pray that that same outreach passion will live among us today and that we will honor Patrick by being evangelists like him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske reminding you that every day is a day of God's grace for you. Pastor Jeske wants you to experience the fullness of God's grace in every aspect of your life. At timeofgrace.org, access more resources than ever, on-demand searchable video, enhanced social media, new ways to connect, including an expanded prayer ministry and exclusive sites for ambassadors and grace partners at timeofgrace.org. Have you ever wondered about the significance of your own life? Do you ever question the existence of God and what a personal relationship with Him really means? Pastor Mark would like to send you a free copy of the Time of Grace booklet, Is There Hope for Me? If you, a friend or loved one, needs answers, straight talk and real hope, call, email or write us to order your free copy today. And please pray about becoming a Grace Partner to help us reach even more people with the message of God's love. Call 800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. And join us again next time for Time of Grace. The preceding program was made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.